Hey guys, this video today is going to be about uh, journeying through the wall. It comes from the book Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. We're going to be diving into the workbook portion of it and going through a couple questions and some thoughts on it. And uh, But before we do, we're going to have you guys uh, watch a video that was put together. Uh, it's kind of a summary of this chapter in the book. I highly recommend getting the book itself and going through the chapter. It's chapter four. But if you don't have the time to do that, uh, definitely watch this video and you're going to find uh, gems in there that we're going to discuss afterwards. All right, here's the video. The image of the Christian life as a journey captures our experience of following Christ like few others. Because journeys involve movement and action, stops and starts, detours, delays, trips into the unknown. It also gives us the long view of the Christian life. Think about it. God called Abraham to leave his past in Ur at the age of 75 to go on a journey. God called Moses out of a burning bush to begin a new phase of his life at the age of 80 to go on a journey. God called the Israelites to leave Egypt and embark on a 40-year journey of personal transformation in the desert to the Promised Land. God called David to leave the comforts of his job as a shepherd, as a teenager, to fight Goliath and take a journey that would lead him to serve as King of Israel. Jesus called the 12 disciples to change their lives forever, leave their jobs to go on a journey with him. You're on a journey and so am I. But it's a truth about the Christian life that at one point or another, you will hit a wall. By a wall, I'm referring to a season in your life when you will feel stuck. Consider the story of a woman named Agnes. From the time she was a young girl, Agnes believed, not just believed, she was on fire. She wanted to do great things for God. She said things such as she wanted to love Jesus as he'd never been loved before. Agnes had an undeniable calling. She, she wrote in her journal that my soul at present is in perfect peace and joy. She experienced a union with God that was so deep, so continual, that for her it was a, a rapture, an ecstasy. She left her home. She became a missionary. She gave up everything. After a while, however, it seemed as if God had abandoned her. At least that's how it felt to her. She started writing different words in her journal, words like, where is my faith? And she asked, deep down, there, there's nothing but emptiness and darkness. Oh God, how painful this is, this unknown pain. I have no faith. She struggled to pray. She still worked, she still served, she still smiled, but she struggled at the wall that didn't seem to move. This inner darkness continued on year after year for nearly 50 years. God seemed absent. Such was the secret pain of Agnes, who is better known today as Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa wrote letters intended, not only, intended really only for her spiritual directors about the torment in her soul, but after her death, they were published, and these letters stunned people. Some prominent atheists said that Mother Teresa had lost her faith. Many said she struggled with clinical depression. But spiritually, she would hit a wall. But as we know today, God was doing a mighty work in and through her, and it was this wall that made her the great woman she is today. I meet many believers today who are also at a wall. Some have even dropped out. They often fail to see the larger picture of the transforming work of what God is seeking to do in them that this wall is essential to their maturing in Christ and becoming the person God intends. And the disorientation, the pain of their present circumstances, it blinds them. But throughout church history, great men and women have written about the phases of this journey to help us understand the larger map, the larger picture of what God is doing in our lives. In the critical journey stages in the life of faith, the authors developed a model that included the essential place of the wall in our journeys. And the following is my adaptation of their work. I want you to note that each stage builds naturally upon the other. In the physical world, babies must grow into young children and then into teenagers who become adult, men and women. In a similar way, spiritually, each stage builds on the ones that go before it. An important difference, however, is that we can stagnate very easily at a certain stage and choose not to move forward in our journeys with Christ. We can refuse to trust God into this unknown, mysterious place. So let's take a look at the stages. So stage one, you'll notice, it's called life-changing awareness of God. This stage, whether in childhood or adulthood, is the beginning of our journey with Christ as we become aware of his reality. We realize our need for mercy and begin our relationship with him. Stage two is discipleship. This stage is characterized by learning about God and what it means to be a follower of Christ. We become part of a Christian community and we begin to get rooted in the disciplines of the faith. Stage three is the active life. This is described as the doing stage. 
We get involved, we actively work for God, we serve him and his people. We take responsibility, we bring our unique talents and gifts to serve Christ in the world. Stage four is the wall and the journey inward. Notice that the wall and the inward journey are closely related. The wall drives us into an inward journey. In some cases, people feel compelled to this journey that, that eventually leads them to the wall. Other times, it's the wall that leads them to the inward journey. It's rightly been said that 85% of evangelicals do not get through the wall. Our image of God often does not allow for such a difficult experience. But if we get through it, we end up in stage five, which is called the journey outward. Having passed through the crises of faith and the intense inner journey work necessary to go through the wall, we begin once again to move outward to do for God. We may do some of the same active external things we did before, like give leadership or initiate acts of mercy toward other people. The difference is now that we're giving out of a grounded new center in ourselves with God. And then stage six is transformed by love. That's really God's goal in the language of John Wesley, is that we might be made perfect in love, that Christ's love becomes our love, both towards God and other people. We realize that love truly is the beginning and it's the end. And by this stage, the perfect love of God has driven out all fear. We're free. And the whole of our spiritual lives is finally about surrender and obedience to God's perfect will. For most of us, the wall appears through a crisis that turns our world upside down. It comes perhaps through a divorce or a job loss, the death of a close friend or family member, a cancer diagnosis, a disillusioning church experience. The wall might come through a betrayal or a shattered dream or a wayward child or a car accident or an inability to get pregnant or a deep desire to marry that remains unfulfilled or a dryness or loss of joy in our relationship with God. We question ourselves, we question God, we question the church, and we discover that for the first time our faith doesn't appear to work. We have more questions than answers at the very foundation, as, uh, at the very foundation of our lives, and it feels like our, our faith is on the line. We don't know where God is, we don't know what he's doing, we don't know where he's going, how he's getting us there, or when this will ever be over. I've experienced uh, at least five or six major walls in my life, each of which changed me forever. Uh, let me just share two. Uh, the first was in 1994, when, when we had a, a split in one of the congregations in Spanish that we had established. I, I felt betrayed, I was outraged, my faith was shaken. Everything in me wanted to quit Christianity. Uh, that was the beginning uh, of this whole expanded view of God and scripture that we call emotionally healthy spirituality today. Uh, the second was in actually 1996 when my marriage with Jerry hit a wall. Uh, our marriage was in deep trouble, we were great friends, but God met both of us out of that deep season of pain. Uh, and out of that help that we, we eventually got and went after, we have a marriage today that's so far beyond any of our dreams. We made a decision to live out of the joy and overflow of our marriage. And equipping and training people to have marriages that taste and point to heaven is actually the greatest joy of our lives. And it comes out of the fact that we didn't have it in our early years. And so on a certain level, it's correct to say that walls come to us in various ways throughout our lifetimes. It's not simply a one-time event that we pass through and get beyond. It appears to be something that we return to as part of our ongoing relationship with God. We see this, for example, in Abraham. He's waiting at the wall for 25 years for his first child with his wife, Sarah, to be born. He hits another wall when he has to let go of his eldest child, Ishmael. 10 to 13 years later, God leads him again to another wall, the sacrificing of his son that he loves, Isaac, on an altar. So regardless of how we get there, every follower of Jesus at some point will confront the wall. The best way to understand the dynamics of the wall is to examine the classic work of John of the Cross. Uh, in, in his famous book, The Dark Night of the Soul, it was written 500 years ago. I mean, he describes the journey uh, in, in three phases, beginners, progressives, and perfect. But to move out of being a beginner stage, he says, it requires receiving the gift of God that comes through the dark night or I'm calling it here, the wall. He says this is the ordinary way that we grow in Christ. And a failure to understand this is one of the major reasons many people start out on the journey but do not finish. So how do we know we're in a dark night, as he calls it? Well, our good feelings of God's presence evaporate. We feel the door of heaven perhaps has been shut as we pray. There's a sense of darkness or helplessness, weariness, a sense of failure and defeat and dryness and emptiness kind of descends on us. The Christian disciplines or the way that we've lived it out, the Christian life up to now, they don't really work any longer. 
we really can't see what God's doing and, and there's little visible fruit externally in our lives. This actually is God's way, he writes, about of rewiring and purging our affections, our, our passions, as he calls it. He, he does this so that we might delight in God's love and enter into a rich, fuller communion with him. You see, God wants to communicate to us his true sweetness and love. He, he longs for us that we might know his true peace and rest. But to get there, however, false layers and unhealthy attachments inside of us must be burned away. Only then will we actually be able to taste and see that the Lord is good. Only then will we actually surrender to his will and his love and not our own. At the wall, we learn that true faith is trusting God even when we don't feel him. You may hate walls. We may hate walls, but they are God's gift to us. So let me just close with two thoughts here. First is, there is a difference between walls and trials. The trials we encounter each day are not the wall or the dark night of the soul. Trials are traffic jams, annoying bosses, delayed airplane departures, car breakdowns, fever, barking dogs in the middle of the night. James consider them, considers them in James 1, consider it pure joy, my brothers, he writes, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That's trials. Walls are David fleeing a jealous king for 13 years in the desert for his life. Walls are 11 disciples of the crucifixion who are confused and disoriented and wondering if they've wasted their whole lives. Walls are Job losing his 10 children, his health, and his possessions in a day. But secondly, it's all, it can be difficult to discern precisely when we began the journey through the wall and when we might actually be on the other side of the wall. Ultimately, God is the one who moves us through the wall. And with that comes mystery. There's a lot we do not understand about the ways of God. His ways are not our ways. Yet there are rich treasures at that wall. Our image and understanding of God is dramatically transformed. We often have God in a very small box. The wall blows that box open. We begin to see God for who he really is, sovereign, mighty, loving, good. Our work at that wall is to stay with God, to persevere, to faithfully wait on him, to stick with him, even when everything in us wants to quit and run. Why? For he's good and his love endures forever. Failure to understand and surrender to God's working in us at the wall often results, if not always results, in long-term pain and confusion. I know many people have had been through great sufferings and hit massive walls. Yet the walls did not change them. They only bounced off them. They returned to a similar but different wall later. Yet receiving the gift of God at the wall that comes to each of us transforms our lives forever in ways that we never dreamed. So enjoy. Hope you guys enjoyed that video. Uh, I know I did. In watching that, um, Pete talked about going and taking a look at the story of Abraham. We're going to do that and dive right in. It's uh, the, the story comes from Genesis chapter 22, uh, verses 1 through 14. Uh, so if you want to take a look with us, you can dive into your own Bible, but I'll read it right here. Uh, essentially what it's about is Abraham and his earthly uh, pilgrimage with God appears to go through a number of walls. As uh, Pete said, that, that dark night of the soul, right? Um, his greatest one, however, came when God asked him to do the unthinkable, to kill his only son, Isaac. So let's take a look and read in uh, chapter 22, starting in verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up. Of course, I would too. 
and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The father, uh, or the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on that mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So, that's a pretty gnarly uh, story. I'm sure maybe you've heard it, even if you aren't familiar with um, too much of the Bible. But, uh, I have some questions. We're going to dive in and, and see how we would respond in some of these situations. In particular, the first one we're going to start with is, uh, if you have been through a wall, how did it impact you or your view of God? Think about that for a minute. If you've been through a wall, a dark night, a, a time of, of confusion, deep uh, sorrow, um, how did it impact you or your view of God? Maybe... Uh, Notice I did say through. Uh, Pete says like 85% of people uh, won't make it through the wall. Literally, they'll, they'll run or hide or whatnot. But this is if you make it through, okay? Uh, maybe you, you have more trust towards God. Maybe you have less anger or, or you're less frustrated uh, less often. You have uh, more patience with others. Maybe some of those things come to mind. In my case, uh, as I went through a wall, uh, I was thinking about it for myself. I recognized that God was fully in control. And that freed me from always having to strive to try and control things. And uh, that brought a lot less frustration. I was able to be more patient with people and I uh, definitely trusted God a lot more. How about the next question? How would you hear the words yourself in verse two? Take your son, your only son, whom you love and sacrifice him. How would you hear that if that was being asked of you? Maybe uh, you might think, what a sick joke. Or what did I do wrong? Or what about the promise that God had given Abraham, right? What about the things that he's promised you, right? Would you look for an escape from this? Maybe that's the first thought that, that comes to mind, how you would deal with it. How about a, what might be tormenting Abraham as he bound his son and laid him on the altar? What thoughts might be tormenting him? What, what things might be going through his heart, his mind? Maybe unbelief? Uh, maybe I didn't hear him right. Um... Why would God do this? 
sense of abandonment from God, a disillusionment that maybe um, the the promise that he had been given <clears throat> that his son would be uh, a man who eventually uh, many nations would come from. Kings, he said, would come from. And then all of a sudden he's asking him to sacrifice him. Maybe uh, emptiness within. A deep sense of pain or defeat or a sense of failure. Where did I go wrong? All of that could lead you to be weary. Probably many thoughts are going through his mind and tormenting him. And that definitely would, would wear you out. Let's take a look at the next question that Pete put together for us. How is your image of God challenged by the story? How do you look at God now when you see a story like that and you really take the time to analyze it? Maybe he doesn't think like us? Or he values things differently, obviously. There's, he must. I wouldn't do that to my kid, right? I wouldn't put him through uh, torture. The kid, the child, must be in that moment um, with his dad standing there and labeling him as the sacrifice, he's got to be just jacked up inside and probably going to have some trust issues with his dad after, right? Why would God do that, right? Or uh, for me, the challenge was God's really serious about our devotion to him. He knew, God knew that he was going to heal uh, or, or provide a sacrifice in this moment um, and that he could heal the kid and his scars uh, in his mind and heart down the road. But um, he certainly is serious about our devotion to him. He took the most valuable thing to Abraham, no doubt having been a hundred years old and had his, his kid that the promise was going to come through. And he, he asked him to, to lay that down and see if he was willing to, to let that go. What are some reasons you have a hard time moving through walls yourself? What are some things that hold you back? Um, from actually journeying all the way through the pain of the wall. You see it as punishment, maybe? Instead of a process? You feel like it's too much, uh, or, or you're too much of a mess? You'll never make it, so you just throw your hands up and give up? You might feel like the pain is just too much to handle, maybe. Maybe that's it. You're going through, whether, whether it be like Pete gave some examples, a diagnosis of cancer or <clears throat> a, uh, a loss of a job. Various things that are very, very real and very hard. Maybe the pain is just too much to handle. Or maybe you're afraid of the unknown. Maybe that's it. You don't know if there's going to be a benefit on the back side. So that may keep you from actually journeying through the wall. I know for myself, he talked about um, times where People don't they go th up to a wall and then they they bounce back off it and and journey backwards and 
God brings them to a similar wall. And I had uh, a, a situation um, that I believe God brought me to a wall and I did not go through it. And then I went up against it again and I did not go through it. I literally went through the same situation about four times and it was definitely difficult. Um, but then I finally journeyed through it. And uh, that fear of the unknown uh, and all those emotions that were rattled within me, <clears throat> they were all real and they were without question. At times, uh, it felt like too much to handle. But um, in God's grace, uh, as I fell at his feet and surrendered to him, he actually brought me through. Now, the next question is, to grow, we all go through walls. This is God's way of rewiring us and purging our unhealthy affections and passions so that we might delight in his love and enter into a fuller uh, communion with him. How does this perspective encourage you today? How does it change your thoughts towards the 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 hard um, things that are in front of you. Maybe the long view helps us through the pain, realizing that he he's the only one that can purge unhealthy things out of us, and and that's encouraging. I mean, I know <clears throat> in working out, there's that term we've all heard. No pain, no gain, right? But in this case, we're going to hit this, these walls, this, these pains in our life. And at least if we know that there's a gain on the back end, it seems like the, knowing that the unhealthy things being purged out of my life, it's good. It's for good. And sometimes just knowing that a bad thing has purpose can actually be, uh, in and of itself, the encouragement we need to go through the wall. For me, um, I want to share in in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through like 7, Paul the Apostle says uh, that essentially he went through a suffering <clears throat> so that he could be comforted with the comfort that he could then comfort others with. And so it was useful. Literally, the stuff that he went through, that he suffered through, he was then comforted so that he could be a comfort to others. And for me, that was a turning point. When I read that verse in, in the Bible, um, or those verses, uh, it became a turning point. I literally felt like, okay, the suffering I had been through, the things I had gone through, they were useful or they're going to be useful for when I sit down with somebody that has the situation that I had and, uh, and I'm able to, to tell them that there's hope. The next question is, uh, through Abraham's wall, he came to know God as provider in even the most desperate of situations. So he's in this moment, he's, he's looking and there's no sacrifice but his kid. But then he looks up and there's a, a, a ram in the thicket and God provided for him, right? So he even, he now knows God as provider in a very unique way. How might this encourage you in your situation? Think of areas you've doubted God. These now become opportunities for him to show you his true character. On the other side of the wall, there are four primary characters that uh, characteristics that um, Pete talks about <clears throat> that's found in life. These are once you've gone through the wall, okay? It's a greater brokenness, a greater appreciation for mystery of God, 
a deeper ability to wait on God, a detachment from the things of the world. Which one of those things stand out to you as something maybe God's working on in your life? So I'll just share from my own experience. Um, I have honestly experienced all four. However, I'll tell you, um, the biggest, I would say, um, wall that I've had in life is actually the fact that when I was in the school of ministry for pastoral training, it was, gosh, I think 2003, something like that, uh, to 2005, it's full-time ministry school, um, for two years. And, uh, <clears throat> in that time, I got a word from God and I wrote it down in my Bible and it said that one day he would raise me up as a shepherd and that I would um, be basically learning lessons until he opens that door. Then I had weird experiences where I was always looking for that to happen, that moment to happen. And, but like a few years goes by and some guy walks up, um, the, this preacher, uh, was, I was at a church. It wasn't my church. I was at, uh, someone uh, visiting somebody I was at their church. And literally this guy at the end of the message and the message was on the 40 years of preparation on the backside of the desert for Moses. Okay. And how important it was for his calling because he had such a great calling. This guy, a few um, rows up, maybe seven rows up, at the end of the message, walks down the aisle, looks at me. I've never seen him a day in my life. He goes, this message was for you. And then he just kept walking. I have had moments like that, similar to that, over and over and over. Now, a lot like Abraham having to wait 25 years for the promise of a child and me having now it's I think 18, 19 years, something like that. Um, God has spoken clearly um, recently and, and let us know that we are to plant a church. And I can tell you that in the beginning of my journey of this wall, I was not um, broken. I was not uh, willing to wait on God. I didn't have an appreciation for mystery. And I had a lot of attachments to the world. However, through the process that God has journeyed with me on this long years and years and years of waiting, he's journeyed with me but he's also shaped me and molded me through it. <clears throat> he's brought me to a, a place many times of deep brokenness. He's brought me to appreciate the mystery of God. He's definitely helped me to wait patiently upon him and to know everything is in his timing. I can't rush it. And he's helped me to be, along the way, less and less enamored by the things of this world. So I hope this encourages you on your journey through walls. Um, next week, we're going to be journeying through uh, chapter five. And I hope you guys uh, grab a copy of the book, um, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Looks like this, and uh, it's gonna be quite amazing. I really do recommend getting your own book for the one reason, uh, if nothing else, that you can make all kinds of notes in this thing. I mean, I got notes for days. And uh, we're gonna learn uh, next week about discovering the rhythms of the, the daily office or basically of Sabbath, of taking rest in our life. 
So I uh, hope to see you guys next week. Love you guys. Talk to you soon.